All right, great. So let's wait for two other people, yes? Yep. Yes. Cool. So this by is way, already being recorded, by the way. <laughs> um, not yet. It is already. It is. So oh, okay. just letting you know. <laughs> Should I also record? Because Branya asked me to. So I don't, I don't think you need to. I think I I will have it on my YouTube channel. Um, and so I can just send you guys the link. Okay, so it's through Hangouts on Air. Yeah, it's, it's through Hangouts on okay. Air. Yes. Okay, very reliable. Great, thanks. Yeah. So we just. By the way. Yeah. Yeah, just just wanted to thank you very much for this. Oh no yeah, problem. For... No worries. It's not. It's it's re it's a reasonable time. We're just six six hours, I think, apart, right? Or five? I'm not sure. So it's super mm -hmm. doable. So it's early morning for you. Yeah, it's really late for you guys, though. I would like I I don't mm -hmm. know how you're still awake. I I have. I had a birthday 32 minutes ago, so yay. Wow. Okay. Okay. Let, let, well, I mean, let's try to be efficient with this. Do you have any idea where the other two are? Yeah, uh, they should be joining soon enough. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think it makes sense to just wait for them. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other guys have seen a message in a group chat, so they should be on their way, hopefully. Um, yeah. So I uh, yes, I just sent the I just sent the invites to the email addresses I got. That should work. We have one more guy. Yay, okay, so just one more. Hey, what's up? Hello. Chucky come. No, it's better. No video from you? No, it's like my roommates are sleeping, so I, I don't wanna okay. um, That's use fine. light to, to okay. brighten my face and wake them up. That's fair. You have you don't have like a spare room where it could be like us. Not, well, not really. I mean, maybe like the screen can, but no, it won't. No, it won't do much. Yeah, just treat it as an audio. Yeah. So we're only we just need Risco. yeah yeah right. we're just missing one person, and if this person confirmed it probably makes sense to wait for them but I'm not sure what the status of this person is. Yeah, the, that person is online, so I hmm. think that he should. He's bad at writing back in general, though. So. <laughs> oh dear. Prosím tě, Risko, ty debile, prosím tě, nemohl bys se připojit na Skype? Prosím, děkuji. Hello. <laughs> yeah, of course. We're waiting. Thanks. <laughs> Milica. Papa. Yeah, he, he he's trying to connect his computer to Wi Fi. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Cool. And Misho Pachinia won't be joining? I don't know. Okay. Just checking. Uh by the way, Sharms, are you gonna are you gonna coach Philippines this year? 
I'm chairing the motions committee, <laughs> so I uh, can't. Yeah, I can't <laughs> um, coach. I also won't be at WSCC actually. Really? Um, oh. I, I have a conference in Australia. I also just thought that I would take a break this year. Um, mm -hmm. It was very intense last year. Yeah. Are you guys yeah. excited? Yeah. Kind mm -hmm. of. It's a lot of work ahead of us, but yeah. There is, there is. But I mean, you guys are probably the strongest Slovakian team in a long time. So that should be exciting. Oh. They have me right Maybe. <laughs> Transferred from one country to another. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. With him. Hmm. Where is your friend? I'm worried because like, you guys are up late. No, it's fine. Right. Yeah, that's okay. I have Student to. Life. I have to read uh, a book, nineteen eighty four, for you tomorrow. And, yeah. But I didn't start yet. I have it for tomorrow or like today. <laughs> it's gonna be a long night. Ah, uh, they're just three. Sorry. Um, it's a short book though, but it is very, very, very heavy mm -hmm. and depressing. <laughs> Yeah. I liked, I guess I'm going to like Animal Farm more than this. Um, This is a lot heavier, I feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. But the the, the Animal Farm, like I, I like the contrast to like capitalism and how yeah. exploited no, the system that, is. That was very good as well. I was also not too happy. Hmm. <laughs> Is he here? No. Sorry, we were just calling with a guy. Yeah, sure, no worries. Uh, no, it be tak byť. Mal byť ten normálne ísť join keď si otvoríš angouty, ale... Is he even made he, he is added there. A čo ti presne ukazuje? Skúsiš to ešte raz, či... Can I disconnect him and connect again? No. Prípadne pri najhoršom na mobile. Wait, is it Hangouts that doesn't work for him, or is it the internet overall? Uh, wait a second. Mati, so what's... Uh, like, he's trying to connect, but it's just loading without doing anything, apparently. So it is his internet that's a problem, Ben. Or maybe his computer in general, I don't know. Uh, we really apologize, like, seriously. No, it's, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. It's like, just... It's just... Okay, he's in the call. We're good. Mm -hmm. Let's just... Um, Richard, can you hear us? Hello, guys. Can you hear me? All right, excellent. We're good. Yeah, yeah. So it's just us, right? Yeah, hi. Okay. Hello. No, no problem. This has happened to me so many times. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do now is give an introduction to feminism. I want to keep the lecture part brief. Um, and obviously feminism is really, really broad. I'm focusing on the parts that are relevant to your debating life. So more than like academia. Um, mm -hmm. What I'll do is I will jump right away into the different perspectives and the different debates within feminism. A lot of times it's less, I mean, a lot of times it's a lot more messy than I will make it seem. But what I want to do is isolate their differences, because that's usually what plays out in debate rounds, right? Usually in debate rounds, no one is going to say, oh, we don't believe in equality. It's always, we believe in equality, but what's the best way to get there? Certain ways make sense, certain ways don't make sense. So how do feminists negotiate these things? But just a quick 
background for you to appreciate uh, the idea of feminism, right? Like what, what it's trying to do. Um, there are two components to feminism. In, um, one is the theoretical dimension. So that's the more academic stuff, like understanding uh, women as objects of knowledge, as subjects of knowledge. What does it mean? What does woman mean? What does it mean when we say someone is a victim? What does it mean when we say someone is empowered? So these are like very theoretical questions. And also a very, feminism is also a very practical project. It's also a political project, right? There are specific political aims. And usually debates are more concerned with these aims. So they are more concerned with looking at gender as a power structure uh, within laws, but not just laws also social and cultural norms. So we need to ask ourselves, what are the things that regulate our lives, right? What are the things that influence our lives? What are the sources of authority over our lives that govern our conduct? Some people have a very like legalistic conception of this. They're like, oh, the law is what tells us how to behave. And the moment you change the law, everything is fine. Or the law is the most important thing that we should try to change. Some thinkers will disagree with this, and they're like, there are so many regulatory mechanisms in the social world that legislation is just one of them. Cultural norms is another. Uh, religions and religious belief structures are another. So it's one thing to change the law, but all of these other regulatory mechanisms still exist. Uh, and we'll see feminists like argue about this, right? As I will explain in a bit. Um, and the other thing feminists have done historically is they've challenged the default assumption, usually in science, in medicine, in uh, even in law. When we speak of the human person, the traditional figure that comes to mind is a male figure. So a lot of masculine behavior is just assumed to be default human behavior. And feminists are like, wait, 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 you need to study women too. You need to study women's behavior as well, like your default person even if you look at the enlightenment right this like idea of a radiant man it's always a man even in sports it's always a man they're like wait why have you defaulted to the assumption that when we discuss humanity it's always a male figure right so feminists have also challenged this anyway so that's a that's a background so when you think usually in debates when we say the feminist movement as an actor it's usually a form of a collective action, right? So there's like a set of members or constituents, um, and then there's some degree of organization or cohesion. So a lot of feminist movements are actually very horizontal. So you're not going to have like, oh, the, unlike a labor union, where you have like the leader of the labor union, um, throw back to last year's motion, <laughs> or you have a leader of the labor union, you have like elected representatives. A lot of feminist organizations are a bit more fluid because they believe in like, sharing power right they're especially critical of existing power structures but there is some degree right. of organization and cohesion there's some common agenda although they fight over their agenda as well and most of the time their basis for coming together is they all identify as female although some feminists will challenge that as we will see so we'll discuss uh four feminist perspectives now the liberal perspective, the Marxist perspective, the radical perspective, and the post-structuralist perspective. We're not going to go into super detail for each one. What I want to highlight here is where they disagree with each other and where they would have different proposed solutions for problems. Sometimes they also understand the problem differently, right? So a lot of their debates also revolve around how you conceive of choice. So one feminist might look at a specific action of a woman and go, that's an informed and empowered choice. We should celebrate it. While another feminist might be like, no, 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 no. While there is technically consent there, that is still problematic because the choice is significantly uh, impaired by cultural conditioning or by, by other softer forms of coercion. Like even if you don't have a gun to someone's head, like there are so many other variables that that make it very difficult for them to choose otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. So the way feminists conceive of choice, I mean, I can't speak for every single debate, but most feminist debates will have a discussion of how you, how you characterize choice. So a lot of times in prep, when you, you, you have a feminist motion, not all the time, not all the time, but a lot of times in prep, a good place to start, especially when it's talking about like, occupations or changes to behavior is 
how do we tell a story about the choice that's happening in this in this uh, in this position uh, in our side, right? For the women on our side. So the liberal perspective, how do they paint a picture of the problem? The problem for them is that women's oppression is rooted in uh, customary legal and political constraints, right? That block uh, women's access or success in the public sphere. So they're like, oh, we didn't allow women to vote. That's a problem. We must allow them to vote. We didn't allow women to work. That's a problem. We must allow them to work, right? So a lot of times, because they think of the problem as legal or political blocking uh, blocks, then their suggested solutions are to fix legal and political problems. So a lot of their so so solutions center on the public sphere, right? They want to change political procedures. Uh, they want to change political practices and political institutions so that there's an equal playing field for men and women. And for them, once we have changed these regulations, once we have changed the laws, any subsequent outcomes should just be understood as a matter of personal choice. And therefore, it's not relevant to politics anymore. Of course, I'm simplifying a little bit, but this, this is how this is likely to play out in debates, right? So for liberal feminists, individual agency and free choice are very important within a framework of justice. So for them, power is kind of like a neutral thing. You just want to redistribute it equally. Once women have access to power, all is good. Now, so for example, in a world where women can now work, it's not illegal for women to work, women can now go to college, women can now get degrees, so there are no barriers, there are no formal barriers. And yet most women still continue to be paid less or still continue to choose motherhood over working. A liberal feminist is going to say, oh, they've chosen that, right? That's not coercive anymore because they had the option otherwise, but they've chosen that. Or if a woman undergoes cosmetic surgery and chooses to do so, like pays out of her own pocket, is not like is not visibly coerced to do this, a liberal feminist might go, yeah, that's a free choice that she made. It's an empowered choice to talk through this. And, and there are ways to defend this, of course. Like you go, um, of course, all choice is conditioned, but that is true for everyone in society, right? All the poor people have limitations on their choice. Um, everyone is subjected to cultural norms. But in as far as all choices are conditioned, this is still like reasonably free. Um, so for liberal feminists, change public political procedures, change formal processes, right? Enter the Marxist feminists, right? So they focus on materialism. Marxist feminists are like, no, 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 no. That's inadequate, right? Humans are what they do especially what they do in the course of producing subsistence, right, of producing life. So women's oppression is a product of a capitalist political and economic structure. So there are deeper structural forces. The laws are simply a symptom of those even deeper structural forces. So to the liberal feminists, they're like, your solutions are very band-aid. A lot of times they're very tokenistic, right? You're just scratching the surface, but what you're dealing with are largely symptoms. There are broader structures that are problematic. Um, so the ruling group, who is usually men in the eyes of Marxist feminists, they control the rules of society uh, because they control the material base, right? They control the means of production. But once you are able to control economics, you're also able to control ideas and ideologies, right? So even the production of ideas is something that they control. So men engage in not just physical and economic oppression, but also mental oppression, right? So unlike liberal feminists who, try, who kind of see power as just like a neutral thing that we just need to redistribute, for them, they see power as repressive, right? And flowing from a centralized source. It's very top to bottom. So for them, small changes don't really undermine the bigger structure and a lot of their solutions are a bit more structural right so for example they will say um when women so a, a liberal feminist might be like look if a woman chooses to engage in surrogacy she lends her womb uh to another family to another couple or to another person for profit in order to like for them to have a, a child maybe a biological child um, 
that's completely fine. That's an informed choice. She has a right to her body. Let her do whatever she wants. A Marxist feminist is going to go, but it is likely to be only poor women who are engaging in this. And that choice isn't really absolutely free uh, because of the pressures to their duties and their obligations to be a loved one. Like maybe someone is doing this because they want to feed their family, they want to feed their parents, they want to feed their children, or they're doing it for survival. This is a form of economic violence. This is a form of uh, coercion. And this choice is not free. Or, and the liberal feminists can go, no, 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 of course you're aware of the risks. Like you, there are checks and balances, like processes that you need to follow. So again, they're correcting the processes, right? They're like, as long as we have counseling, as long as we have medical screening and regular checkups after, it should be fine. And the uh, Marxist mm -hmm. feminist is like, no, but the problem is bigger than that. It is like a structural, Im structural constraint on your choice. It's not simply a question of like more counseling, right? Um, or even the idea of motherhood. Um, Marxist and radical feminists might say, oh, but women are culturally conditioned into this. You are made to believe that it's a very rewarding experience. Uh, so a lot of people who think that um, who think that could choose to do it are not really choosing freely because they never got to explore the option of what if we don't do it because they're regularly bombarded with images of it's a good thing. And they are also suspicious of uh, everyone who says it's great. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. They're like, yeah, because you can't say otherwise, because if you say otherwise, you will get crucified by society because of the norms that exist. And it is in the interest of capitalist society to ensure that women are continuously like producing children, especially like when we lived in agrarian societies or during the Industrial Revolution, right? Like you needed labor. Um, so another thing like the Marxist feminist might say to the liberal feminist is, so liberal feminists will usually uh, support things like affirmative action for women. You guys are familiar with the concept of affirmative action, right? Yep. So Marxist feminists might say, what's that for? Affirmative action usually benefits elite women or at best middle class women. When you reserve seats in parliament, like what you what's happened in Egypt, for example, uh, it's just the wives, this was under Mubarak, um, it's just the wives of the people in power. It's just conservative women who benefit from these things. Uh, so Marxist feminists, so you know a lot of corporate success stories. So you know the Sheryl Sandberg story, right? Facebook. Um, so you know Marissa Myers was CEO of Yahoo. Even Hillary Clinton. So liberal feminists tend to celebrate female success when women break the class ceiling, right? And then Marxist feminists are like, huh, they're not actually real models for us. Like Sheryl Sandberg has two Ivy League degrees. Like Marissa Myers comes from a very rich family. Like obviously it became easier for them to do those things, but they they did they they succeeded in spite of the impediments. Their privilege is not accessible to many other women. Marxist feminists also kind of suspicious sometimes of uh, women in power because again they view power as repressive, right? So they're like you turn into the men, you become what you hate. So a lot of times women in power actually behave in ways that like end up reproducing the power structure. So I guess you can make the same criticism of women like Condoleezza Rice. Uh, you're familiar with Condoleezza Rice, right? Secretary of State in the Bush era. Or uh, even like the women around Trump right now. So Kellyanne, his Homeland Security Advisor, Ivanka. Like you can argue, yes, they are women, and yay, they have access to power, but look what they're doing with that power, right? It's very suspicious of those things because for them, class is more is a more is a more important or at least an equally important variable. Um, the other thing about this, so they they say to liberal feminists, sometimes your solutions are very tokenistic, and in fact, your solutions can be easily co-opted by the patriarchy or the capitalist system. What does it mean to be co-opted? you initially present yourself as a counterforce, as a resistance, but in the process, what you actually end up doing is you get absorbed by the system and then you strengthen that system. So in some ways you can argue affirmative action is like that, or Sheryl Sandberg in Facebook is like that. Now institutions can claim to be feminist because they can say, look, oh, we have, look, we have like so many women here, but actually the women are behaving in traditionally patriarchal ways anyway, right? So the criticism of Marxist feminists is, a lot of liberal reforms are token or 
they make the system worse because they give it a veneer of legitimacy, right? The other concept that uh, Marxist feminists have, I personally am not a very big fan of this of this concept, but is the idea of false consciousness or a better way of calling it is probably adaptive preferences where they go because your minds and not just your bodies are being controlled because you are ideologically conditioned, you start thinking that certain things are good for you when in fact they are not, when in fact a neutral observer, I don't know what a neutral observer is, might actually determine that this is not good for you, but you are choosing to participate in these practices or rituals. So this isn't a specifically Marxist uh, example. This is more a, more a Western feminist example. But a lot of Western feminists, I'm just, what I'm trying to illustrate at this point is the idea of false consciousness, OK? A lot of Western feminists say that Muslim women have false consciousness when they, dis when they justify wearing the burqa or the hijab, right? So the argument is, you think you have a choice. You think this is a good thing but you have been so culturally conditioned such that it is impossible for you to think otherwise. This is an ongoing debate, whereas some Muslim feminists are going to go, you're misunderstanding the logic behind wearing the hijab or the burqa, and this is actually um, our display of modesty, our assertion of like belief in our God. Uh, for some of us, it actually gives us more agency because it allows us to leave the home. So it's a lot more complicated than what you're making it seem. So that's the constant back and forth. Um, adaptive preferences would be when someone like has come to prefer a certain course of action because, because of the severe limitations that exist. So for example, someone who goes, I prefer to be a sex worker because as a poor woman, my only alternatives are to beg, to work as a domestic helper, or to be financially dependent on my abusive husband. So, okay, in this context, you prefer sex work, but that's because it's a very, very constricted choice, right? So anyway, those are the Marxist feminists. By the way, when I when I describe the pros and cons, I'm not really passing any judgment on who is correct or who is not correct. I'm just trying my best to represent the debates. Um, yeah, that's fine. And then, also, Marxist feminists are like, congratulations, liberal feminists. You have now removed some of the barriers to women working in the workforce. But this is absolutely not enough. Because in a world where men control the means of production, and in a world where um, they control the rules and the regulations, e even not the formal ones, but the informal ones, we will still have problems like sexual harassment in the workplace. We will still have problems like the double burden, where, OK, it's great. Women are now formally part of the labor force. But when they come home, the expectation is they still take on a lot of domestic and household burden. So they do the bulk of the household chores. They do most of the child rearing. So in effect, what you've had is a double burden on women. So have you really liberated them, or have you just like found a different expression for their oppression, right? Um, so these are some questions you have from Marxist feminists. Now, the radical perspective uh, is a little bit like the Marxist perspective. I think the biggest difference between them is uh, the Marxist perspective really puts a strong emphasis on class and the critique of capitalism. Whereas the radical feminists are kind of divided here, they want to bring back the focus on sex and gender. Some of them are critical of capitalism, but the, but the others just really want to focus on, on sex and gender as a key theme. So radical feminists will identify certain traits as predominantly female, right? So they're like, look, we exist in a world where either naturally or because of intense socialization and habituation such that it has already become naturalized, certain traits are predominantly female. So a uh, sense of community, a sense of connection to others, a uh, capacity for caring, and certain traits are predominantly male, like aggression, uh, predisposition towards violence, competition, um, emphasis on physical strength, individualism. So this, this is a dichotomy they have in their head. Of course, many people criticize them for this and say people are not born essentially different. But I think the better form of their argument is, but we do end up different because of how we are socialized. Uh, and there are some like uh, 
radical feminist scientists who have done studies on children and they listen to how these children form moral reasonings or justify certain actions or respond to moral dilemmas that are presented to them. And they're able to document that male children have a very individualist centered conception of morality. It's very utilitarian, whereas female children like seem a lot more concerned with community and other centeredness. I mean, these challenges have also been, uh, these studies have also been challenged, right? Um, so for radical feminists, uh, it's important to recapture female sexuality and to deny men's attempts to control women's bodies. So they're like, we're not going to change. Um, we're not going to try to be like men and beat men at their own game. We are going to insist that we get to like celebrate femininity, right? So I've I've brought up Sheryl Sandberg as like one of the main faces of liberal feminism. Have you heard of her book Lean In? Mm, no. Okay, so in her book Lean In, she says she's speaking to an audience of obviously privileged and elite women, right? What she says to them is, um, hey, it is true that you are being paid less, and it is true that you are being passed up for promotion. So this is our problem. It is not true that in all cases it is because the system is out to get you. The way we deal with this is to lean in more. By this, what she means is be more around in meetings, assert yourself, speak your mind, tell people your ideas, negotiate for race with your boss, be more aggressive, just be more present in the workplace. And radical feminists are like, why? Why should women start behaving like men in order for us to succeed? Uh, so there will be some criticism from radical feminists of Hillary, for example, or Condoleezza, because they're like, you supported all the wars. You tried to act like men. Um, I guess the Marxist feminists will have a slightly different take on this. It won't be like, oh, you're acting like men per se, although that's part of it. What they will say is, wow, congratulations, Sheryl Sandberg. How many women can really go up to their bosses and like demand a raise in pay? Or like, how many women, the women who can do it are already doing it. And even then they're not successful. And the women who can't do it, this solution is useless to them. Like congratulations telling like our female waitress to go fight her employer. Um, some situations are just more precarious than others. And in other situations, it's not a question of the woman not doing enough. It's a question of the system taking advantage of her. So stop victim blaming is what the Marxists will say. What the radical feminists will say is why are you asking us to behave more mass in a more masculine way? So you see the emphasis on class versus the emphasis on sex, right? Um, so the radical perspective sees power as inherently patriarchal. So they want to find alternative ways of orienting politics, like the politics of care, the politics of community. So even in terms of the justice system, so Catherine McKinnon is a well-known feminist. I really disagree with her views on sex work and porn because she thinks that they are always wrong. But her views on justice are very interesting, though. So she says, um, we need a more caring, a more compassionate justice system. The strong emphasis on violence and aggression uh, have, have has broken society. It doesn't help the victims. It doesn't help the perpetrators because we're not conscious of the the many variables at play. Like poverty leads people to commit certain crimes, but also socialization of men into violence and aggression. Okay, so these are the radical feminists. The radical feminists also sometimes. Uh, believe in this false consciousness thing. Finally, the fourth perspective. Um, so these are the post-structuralist perspective. So when we say structure, we mean there's a certain order, certain rules and functions uh, that we ascribe to things, right? Post-structuralist perspective is like, we hate structure. We don't believe in like foundational things all the time. Um, so this conception that we have of gender and sex as male and female, this binary that we have, that's wrong. It's a performance. Like no one is born male or female. The fact that we have chosen to classify them as male or female is because it is not that sex creates gender. It is actually that gender creates sex, right? Um, and there's so much evidence to the contrary that male or female is not a natural way to be. Like you have intersex kids, you have so much variance 
among males and among females. Um, and so this binary is, is quite artificial. But when they say artificial, they don't mean it's so easy to shake off. Like they recognize that because as a society, we have structured, a lot of us have structured our lives around this bi binary, it's powerful. It is quote unquote, the reality for many people. But what they want to do, what post-structural feminists want to do is cast uh, doubt on how real, how fixed this reality is. We have chosen to make it fixed, but it actually can be unfixed. It can be resisted. It can be denaturalized because it is not like inherently natural, right? So a lot of their recommendations will, so a, a lot of the post-structural feminists also concern themselves with subversions of the heteronormative matrix. So a lot of trans politics, a lot of um, uh, queer politics, a lot of be belief in playfully uh, subverting gender norms. So you can see the tension between the radical feminists and the post-structural feminists immediately, right? Because post-structural feminists are like, Feminist spaces, feminist identity, feminist standpoints, certain experiences are accessible only to women. Post-structural feminists are like, no, 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 no. Um, power is like a lot more diffuse, like there are multiple sites of oppression. A victim can also be empowered, depends on what, situa what the situation or the context is. Like, let's not be very simplistic with our categorizations. At which point the radical feminists are like, no. Um, you are misunderstanding the nature of the oppression here. Um, so one debate here is the debate about trans, trans women or trans individuals. Some, not all, some radical feminists believe that trans women do not belong in the movement. So they're like, you're not feminists, your struggles are different, like form your own group. Um, because somehow being female bodied from the start is the only way to be able to understand the full weight of like oppression. Post-structural feminists are like, we need to understand how these struggles are connected because it's the same patriarchal logic that governs them. So there's a lot, there's a lot of like fighting there, I guess. So let's go through some other debates um, and how these differences will apply. Then let's just let's let's start uh having a conversation. So again, some feminists believe that the category woman is a um, united category. A woman, the idea of a woman is an identity or as a basis for politics is important. So there is a very, there's a feminist way of knowing or understanding or experiencing the world based on the female body, based on women's expression, uh, experiences of maternity and women's universal oppression, right? There is a group of feminists who are like, wait, there's no universal female sub subject. Like, a lot of um, the forms of oppression are also tied to your race or your class or your ethnicity or your sexuality. So a woman in corporate America who's in a management position versus like a third world domestic worker, you don't have a lot in common, actually. And your struggle should probably be different. Like this first world American woman probably shouldn't be speaking for this third world woman is what this perspective will say. And then of course the deconstruction perspective, right? So there's difference, women are different from everyone else. There's diversity among females, there are differences and there's deconstruction. So this whole, why are we thinking in terms of male and female in the first place? Um, so let's review some of, the way, some of the ways this might be useful in debates. So how will feminists disagree? on what needs to change in our world and why. So how the group defines the problem and how they, this affects how the interventions they support. So when you go, feminists should support the full decriminalization of sex work or feminist, or this house regrets choice feminism. Basically any choice is an empowered choice. Or feminists must always support the right to abortion. It's impossible to be a feminist if you don't support the, if you're not pro-choice, right? So some feminists will say, no, we don't support a full decriminalization of sex work. We think we should keep punishing the buyers and the pimps. No one is really gonna argue to punish the, the worker, right? But the difference here is some feminists think the worker is an empowered worker, should be treated the way we would normally treat workers. Some will argue, no, she's a victim and she should be saved, right? So we should not legalize buying. Um, 
So these radical feminists will say the market is embedded in a patriarchal culture. So the market is not neutral, right? And it's embedded in a social context. So women will always lose in terms of how work is defined and valued. And the male customer will always have power over the sex worker. Uh, women will always be more vulnerable. And if you legalize it, in, you just end up upholding the capitalist framework, right? Um, you entrench the exploitation of women and the violence against them. And you make it hard for us to push for more structural solutions. A liberal feminist might say, look, choices are never fully free and they can never be, but individual women are in the best position to make these decisions for themselves. Uh, we must respect their agency. Um, economic capital leads to political capital. And what we should do instead is protect them when they make these choices rather than make the choices for them, right? So that's like an interesting interplay. I actually have like a lot of other case studies, but I don't want to oversaturate you with them because I prefer to focus on questions. So I'll just go to actually two more case studies. Then, then let's just jump into questions. So one is the idea of he for she feminism. Have you heard this before? Of course. Yeah. So this is hello. Emma Watson in the UN going, hello, men, I invite you to join feminism. So another similar motion that has come out in WSCC Slovenia uh, in 2016, I think, was exclude men from leadership roles in feminist organizations or just exclude men from feminist organizations completely, right? So this is a constant debate within the feminist movement. Like who should represent us? Who should be given voice to speak? And how should we, en we engage with men? So some women view men completely as like the enemy. They're like, you have historically oppressed us. You have so much privilege. We won't give you space because you might you might like take up space that should go to other women. Or other women have experience of like trauma interacting with men, shouldn't be forced to share space with you. But then some other feminists are like, wait, but men are also victims of the patriarchy um and we need them as our allies we need to convince them um and we need them fighting on our side so like that's a that's a constant battle and then some women are like yeah but then we'll be seen as helpless again as the fact that we need men again to succeed in our struggles when the point was we want to make a point that we can do it without them so that's a constant back and forth right um so some women are like, no, we need to engage with men in order to change power structures. Um, and sometimes we need to frame our struggles in a language that men will understand. So, you know, this whole real men don't buy sex, real men don't hit women, or rape is bad, You don't you have a mother or a sister? So some feminists are like, why must it always depend on a woman's relationship to a man? Or a man's like, in, at the end, it still upholds the logic of like masculinity that men are protectors of women, right? When that's what we want to completely abolish because that's part of the problem. Where some women are like, no, 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 it's better that we just redefine masculinity without completely abolishing it because we still need to speak in a language that men can understand, right? Um, it's fine for masculinity to exist if it is a less aggressive, less toxic form. And then some feminists be like, but that's not radical enough. So, and then they have a fight over this, right? Um, the other example I had was, are you guys familiar with this video that went viral like a year or, sorry, two or three years ago of a white woman walking in the streets of New York and getting catcalled? So street harassment is a big deal um, in Western feminist circles, especially. So in that video that went viral, that was produced by Hollaback Girl, you have a woman walking through the streets. She's white. She gets like oh, shouted yes. at. There are like lewd comments. There are propositions. No one actually really touches her. But still, though, like the harassment is threatening, right? Because you never know. Plus, it's just like on its own a violation already of your personal space and sense of security. Um, it was found out that in that video, the cat callers were both uh white men and men of color but for some reason the white men cat callers got edited out so the narrative that was produced was you have a white woman under threat by men of color so obviously feminists of color right non-white feminists were like what the fuck <laughs> like you are constructing an image of the world where our fathers our brothers are the threats and you are the victims. 
and you expect us to join you in this struggle, that could legitimize forms of police brutality and violence against our family members. Like, this is unjust, right? So there's a lot of tension, that, putting it lightly, between black feminists and white feminists, for example, in terms of like the approaches they choose to preference uh, to, to social problems. So there's a tendency for a lot of uh, feminists in mid with middle class white background to preference criminal justice approaches to problems. So which means a, a greater role for the police, a greater role for the justice system, right? So if you have domestic violence, criminal justice approach. If you have sex work, criminal justice approach. But then black women and their families have a different experience for the police. It, they don't view them as like entities. These are obviously generalizations and there, like, there are more nuanced explanations here. But the police in general aren't viewed as an entity that you trust. They're also seen as threats to your lives. So interventions that simply increase their role might not be a fit for that community, right? So they're like, you're not, you can't speak for us. We actually prefer like more social interventions, more community-based ones rather than, or more cultural conversations rather than call the cops, throw someone in jail, right? Uh, because the cops tend to be rougher on us than others. Um, I was just reminded of a related example, but this is not necessarily linked to policing, it is linked to discipline. Even in schools, there are very like small ways where race is a factor. So recently I was reading about dress codes and how there are very, it's invisible and you won't notice it immediately, but how race to some extent might be a factor in how they're implemented. So schools that are like, oh, we girls must dress modestly. But if you come from an ethnic group where you are less likely to be thin and waist-like. So you naturally have curvier bodies. You naturally become more womanly at a younger age. So it's likely that your skirt is going to hike up more. It is likely that your clothes are going to look more fitted. It is likely that your neckline will plunge more. So apparently like younger black or Latino girls are more likely to get disciplined for violating dress codes and looking modest because the same like outfit would look very like modest on a thin white child and i'm like yeah these are very different ways in which race is a factor in sexual policing or in policing people's behavior that we just don't realize anyway that was not as like weighty an example in the debate i imagine as criminal justice but this happens there's lots more i can actually send you my notes but i'd rather like start chatting if you have any questions like 10,000. Well, if I can ask one, sure. one thing. Uh, it, it is like uh, about one specific issue, maybe not that much connected to like the general topic, but uh, I'm really curious and like, so uh, I'm right now a, little, uh, a bit confused with this whole issue of gender and how is like the difference between sex and gender. And I feel that there is a lot of debate happening around, especially on the internet, when you see Ben Shapiro YouTube channel, especially. <laughs> and the idea is that I just feel like I, it's it, it, it is of course it's like like personal uh, question and different opinions might be on this case, but like you as a person who studies that, how do you perceive this question of you know are there more than two genders, and what how how should we as society perceive that so if you just like i know it's going to be biased I by know. your I just want to that. so are there more than two genders i think is like fairly straightforward we just like literally see it in our lives now right there are how do you measure gender anyway like it's partly i guess so gender is traditionally understood to be an expression of your sex, like a set of behaviors or a set of like beliefs or desires that conform to your specific sex initially was understood like that. And then we realized, but I think this is quite simplistic still, oh wait, wait, wait gender does not always um, correspond to your sex. 
because you can have females who are also attracted to other females. So your gender identity can be different from your sex. So you can be a female, but attracted to other women. So then they're like, oh, maybe you're a lesbian. And then um, eventually we're like, oh wait, it's, a bit, it's still a bit more complex than that. Because for some people, they don't even identify with their sex too. And hence you have people going, I want a sex change operation, right? Because the problem isn't just gender. The problem is like with actual, like their conceptions of their body itself. And then some people are like, oh wait, but that's dangerous. The idea of sex change operations, and this is a real debate as well, doesn't that just reinforce the idea that you you are that that your gender must correspond to your sex because these people have a different gender identity and they're trying to make their sex correspond to it when in fact what we should tell people is the sex you're born with doesn't matter just choose the gender identity you want right whereas sex change operations reinforce that link and some people are like first uh leave that up for to people to decide because society does tell you that this correspondence is important then maybe they've internalized that whatever second that's still a completely different identity though um it's not just like add water and mix ah sorry add and stir like to be honest my take on this is um there's going to be no formula and that's completely fine so i kind of sympathize a bit more with the post structuralists here i understand that our vocabulary, well, at least at least English language and um, the legal world and the medical world, our vocabulary is very gendered and we struggle with it. Like just recently, I was trying to write a message to um, an office in Cambridge and I didn't know who I was addressing it to, but to whom it may concern sounded like very pompous and, you know, impersonal. But I was like, I don't want to say dear sir or madam, because like there is a world of uh, different possibilities. Like what if the people didn't identify as sir or madam, but then what am I going to call them? Because I don't know their names. So in the end, I was just like, dear all, because <laughs> hello is so informal, right? So mm -hmm. like even Judith Butler and the others, they do recognize that this isn't, by saying that gender is a performance, they're not saying that it's so easy to cast aside, like changing clothes. Ideally, that's what, you know, our world would probably be a better place if it was like that. But obviously it's not like that. Through constant repetition of specific actions and behaviors and thought processes, it becomes natural, it becomes fixed, right? But it still is a performance in that nothing about this was, or, this is not entirely a biological thing. Like the predisposition towards aggression or the predisposition towards dressing a certain way, a lot of these are, are habituated. So where I would stand here is I'm like, all right, perhaps there might be some medical differences between people born with a different set of biological organs, but I don't think that that should be the basis on which we necessarily classify people. Like, ideally, I would have parents raise their kids in a very gender neutral way. And there are so many permutations that can exist as a result of that. It's not just like, oh, like the three permutations of women and women, woman and woman, man and man, straight couple. Like I think there are a, there's like a, so many possibilities as a, as a result. And that's completely defined by me. But yeah, so that's my ethics. Um, some feminists would disagree. They'd be like, oh no, certain things. Like, we need to emphasize like female and male, especially as a political project. So, okay. I get that too, because they're like, if you have so many, but they're talking about it from the perspective of advocacy and uh, political change, right? They're like, if you have so many different boxes, then how are you going to mobilize, right? If you have like a lesbian identifying woman who still likes men, then how will advocacy work for that? And I'm like, fine, I understand for advocacy purposes why we need to simplify. But in terms of how people live their lives, that also has its own set of harms, right? That's not a very straightforward answer, I know. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Do you have other questions? Um, I do. So I kind of feel like the first interpretation of feminism is the most important in the world, right? As in Arishu, can you maybe speak up more to the microphone? Can you hear me now better? Yeah. Okay. Indeed. So, 
uh, I feel like the first interpretation of feminism is the most common one in today's world, as in there are the most common, the policies that are most commonly passed are in this ideology, right? So do you maybe have any like real life specific examples of, of actions or policies which were passed uh, with the ideology of the remaining three um, three interpretation of interpretations of feminism i'm thinking <laughs> uh mm. so to be to be fair it sometimes you can isolate it in terms of uh oh this policy is specifically liberal like a lot of it will also have to do with um the intensity of the change involved so i think for example abortion rights it's not just purely a liberal issue uh, it's also like a radical women's issue and even a marxist women's issue right um because it was an intervention in the private sphere it was an intervention into um sexual and personal like relationships and interactions women have so there's a default cultural assumption that sex should be for procreation only um and this is like feminists taking control of women's bodies and saying no we are allowed to um we are allowed to like expel anything we conceive of as a threat like if we don't want pregnancy we should be allowed to resist it and obviously the effects of this are a lot more structural like when women are able to choose not to have children or to control the birth and spacing of their children um the list of things that they can now do uh has increased significantly so i probably would say abortion is an example of an intervention that most feminists across all um across all schools of thought would probably agree with um so abortion, to some extent, contraception. Uh, trying to think. Some people will argue that the enactment of the laws against domestic violence might be uh, a more Marxist or radical feminist uh, contribution as well, because it is like intervention into the private sphere, which normally, like some, not all, but some liberal feminists might say, like we shouldn't intervene in people's personal relationships whereas uh marxist and radical families would be like no we should because the home is also a site of violence it's also a site of our uh hierarchies right so maybe that's another example of something that transcends um schools of thought i'm trying to think so I think women, women in the military might be more a liberal thing. So you, in a sense, I'm kind of agreeing with you that a lot of, a lot of the wins are very liberal wins. Um, some radical feminists will be like, why are we celebrating the fact that women can now participate in militaries that have historically committed human rights violations, have been used to. Uh, make lives significantly worse for domestic populations of countries we invade or like you know meddle in like why are women celebrating the fact that they have a greater role now in this institution when in fact we should be resisting militarized masculinity mm -hmm. so that's a big debate about women in the armed forces um another interesting debate is my access to microcredit which was my master's thesis actually i'll try to be very quick with how i describe it i can get quite excited so you guys know what microcredit is right access to small amounts of credit so liberal establishment is like right now there is a gap in terms of access to credit it is easier for men to borrow money than women why men are likely to have more things as collateral they're more likely to own property because historically women have less property because of unfair inheritance laws or whatever all these things right so men are able to say here i have a piece of land let me borrow x amount of money or i have like a i don't know farming equipment or whatever to use as collateral women are unlikely to have that so men have more access to credit access to credit liberal neoliberal assumptions okay access to credit equals you can use this money 
to start a business as capital, earn more money later on. We should give women the same opportunity. So let's give them microcredit. Why is this a good thing? Women with access to credit and thus more income will therefore have a greater say in how household decision making processes, in, in household decision making processes, in how the money is spent. They will have a greater say in spending the money on themselves. They have a better fallback position if they have abusive partners. They can go run away, right? So giving access to credit, women access to credit equals better gender equality. Another justification they have is women are just better with money. Apparently, studies show that in houses where women control more of the income, more of it is spent on education and nutrition rather than if it's male controlled because men are more likely to spend the money on gambling and alcohol. Like I'm not making this up, this is data. <laughs> and, and so um, so development professionals are like, why don't we just go through the women instead? They seem to be more efficient conduits of aid and also we can yay empower them. But you can already see that tension, right? So Marxist feminists are like, excuse me, like your only intervention is literally to give women credit. You are not intervening in the structure of their relationships. You're just like, that's dangerous because what's here are the many bad ways. How do you hear the many ways this can go bad? And as I found out in my thesis, it is indeed a mix of both. The more like the more like egregious ways, which has happened in Bangladesh, by the way, and India is male relatives just tell the women to go borrow money because it's only the women who can borrow and then they take the loan after but then because it's the woman's debt it's kind of the woman's burden to repay right um so great this is this is packaged as a choice right women are told you can or you can't we're just giving you the option but simply putting the option there means it's very hard to say no because your male relatives will pressure you to take it or if you don't take it you are then seen as lazy right because people are like look at that other woman she is doing this and taking care of her kids why are you not doing this too so this option becomes a burden first second so yeah okay great now we have access to credit assuming women invested in a business we have increased their working hours because they still have to take care of the kids they still have to do household chores and now they're running a small business in for which they are indebted and have to repay their debts third what does what does this kind of intervention say about how we think of helping the poor right it subscribes to a logic of you you it is your responsibility completely to get yourself out of poverty and we expect poor women to be entrepreneurial but it's very hard to be entrepreneurial not everyone has a good business sense right also how many I don't know, like how many hairdressers can you really have in one community? How many fish vendors can you really have? How many r shops selling rags and jams can you really have, right? But what happens with this is you give women the money and if the business fails, you tell them it's their fault. So you essentially have made their poverty their fault and their responsibility instead of the responsibility of the state. And usually a lot of these measures are, are accompanied by decreases in state funding so usually the state is like ah oh there you now have a way out of poverty we've given you credit that you must pay back for but go start a business make some money we're going to reduce our subsidies for education and health so first it shifts the responsibility to the woman to get herself and her family out of poverty using strategies that are very entrepreneurial um but second it usually is accompanied by reductions in public spending so what happens is sometimes the women end up using the loans for consumption rather than for business because then they had reduced state spending for their family's needs right so if you use the loan for consumption rather than business when it's time to pay it back you're like oh so you either have to sell your furniture or you have to borrow from loan charts which are higher interest loans or as a result you have to do even extra work like you do your neighbor's laundry you offer to clean people's houses to pay off those loans so the thing that was supposed to help you kind of potentially made your life worse or made it easy for the state to say i don't need to help you anymore because there's this thing that's helping you right plus a lot of other analysis on how access to microcredit sometimes does lead to conflict in the household like husbands becoming lazy and going all right now your problem now 
or not feeling a sense of ownership towards the loan. So if the business fails, oh, that's completely your problem. I'm not going to help you pay it back. Um, and sometimes when you ask microcredit operators why they target women, the answers are quite telling. They end up like, they don't mean to reveal it, but they do. They don't say, oh, for gender empowerment. They're like, oh, it's just easier to collect money from women. Like women are easier to discipline. Women are easier to scare. If you lend money to men and they can't pay you back and you go to their house, you knock on the door and you're like, yo, pay me back now. They like chase you down the street with a machete. But a woman borrower is going to start crying and just find a way to pay you back, even if it means like working harder or or herself not eating, right? Um, so yeah, it's just, is microcredit a new avenue for empowerment or is it just another tool that can be used to expand women's traditional burdens, right? Uh, and when members of the family know that women have access to this, if their business is successful, they're just going to piggyback on it. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying that's why the implementation, if it is implemented, should be done very carefully. And it is not applicable in all cases. Like some women are just not entrepreneurial. Some businesses are just not going to succeed, right? So we can't use this as our default solution, which a lot of liberal feminists seem to like prefer. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, another like thing that many Marxist feminists will say is uh, the the market itself is gendered because our distinctions between paid and unpaid labor are very, very gendered. So when we measure, wait, let me just make notes um, so I don't forget the examples. When we measure um, the GDP of a country, we look at consumption, we look at... Uh, we look at things the moment they are bought and paid, so things the moment they're paid for, right? So for example, someone goes to a store and buys a tray of eggs. The way we measure that is, oh, someone bought a tray of eggs that goes into the record, right, of consumption. What is not measured there, what is invisible there is the labor of a woman who goes home, cooks that for her family, right? So um, Marxist feminists are like, the way we conceive of productivity and the way we conceive of what should be paid or what shouldn't be paid is very, very gendered as well. Um, and uh, they are likely to point at the, to call attention to very gendered effects of specific political policies that might not be immediately visible. So austerity, for example, is a common prescription by uh, international donors like they're like okay you overspent your money we don't really trust the state lots of corruption we're going to lend you money but privatize please and reduce state spending and reduce social spending we all need to tighten our belt so we can save money to pay back our creditors there's a there's a case for this okay like some countries like you need to improve your taxation system your public service is so bloated and inefficient like i'm not saying there's no case for this there is but Austerity also has quite gendered impacts. So if there is less social spending on families, less money for nutrition, less money for education. So let's say before you could afford to buy X amount of food, now you can afford to buy less food, like bread. The price of bread is a usual bellwether for how an economy is doing, right? Who do you think in the family is more likely to first say, I'm not going to eat? Women. The mothers, right? So austerity measures actually have a disproportionate impact on maternal health, especially, um, and maternal nutrition. Because they're likely to be like, oh, children first. And obviously the husband has to because he's the breadwinner, seen as the breadwinner. He needs to maintain his strength and, I don't know, like that. Or even when we reduce funding for elderly care. So we now have uh, reduced funding for older people. A lot of the duty of care, or, or even like kids with special needs and things like that, a lot of the duty of care falls on the women in the family, like the daughters or the wives, uh, to care for sick or ill or dying relatives, which means like their own lives, their own health, or if you want to be mercenary about it, their own earning capacity is also harmed by this, right? So a lot of like social policies, public policies do have gendered impacts. Um, yeah, I was thinking of another example, I forgot it. But anyway, do you have other questions? Yeah, so um, one thing could be, you mentioned that women are generally better with money. 
Mm. Uh, also, in many countries, women are much less likely to drop out of high school and they do better in university in terms of grades. So what could be the factors that are causing this? Um, is it biological in any way or uh, is it purely societal? I don't, it's very hard to say that there are like bio, there's a biological basis for why women are quote unquote more responsible. I don't know and I'm, there might be, I can't speak to it. I am more confident saying that a lot of it is socialization. Women are always trained to not take risks. So in terms of risk appetite, um, women are usually socialized to not take as much risk to always like do things the safe, the correct way. There's also a lot of emphasis on self-sacrifice and putting the family before you, which probably explains why in terms of analyzing how parents would spend the money if uh, men have more. Co so this is assuming a family of limited means, because if it's a wealthy family, it doesn't matter because there's more than enough money, right? But like in low income families, when men have more control over the money, less of it goes to education and nutrition because there's more on personal expense like I said, gambling and alcohol, because they are social, the, the degree of entitlement to recreation, entitlement to like relaxation, this is not a thing that women are necessarily like raised with, whereas men are more, like parents are likely to tolerate this more from, from men. Um, like even just in terms of when you're children, like who gets to go out and stay out later, who is usually asked to help out with the chores first. This of course has a lot of cross-cultural variation and I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but that seems to be what the data does suggest where these studies have been conducted, right? Women are, are taught to put family before self. So I can imagine that's why mothers would be like, oh, I have some money, let us now spend it on clothes for my children or like bring them to the doctor and stuff like that. Um, some people would say, so my explanation is I suspect this is largely social variables at play here. I don't think women are naturally better at money than men or anything like that. Like, I don't think it's any of that. Um, some, some people will argue that we should make a business case. I just got reminded of another idea. We should make the business case for women's empowerment this way. Like we should just point to statistics that say where women have greater ownership over land, land productivity in terms of crop yield is actually greater than when men have ownership over land. Um, and in terms of how women spend money, they're a lot more efficient with the spending and like the family tends to benefit as a unit. So some people are like, we should use this as a justification for why women should be given more control and access to resources and why women should be given more rights. Or when you have more women working, this means more income for the family. When you have women who have access to education or contraception and they have more control over the number of kids they have, they have kids at a later stage, this also has positive social outcomes and benefits to their family. So you can see the business case, right? So some, a lot of liberal feminists actually are like, let's make the business case. But the radical feminists are like, wait, there are some things you cannot make a business case for. And the case is simply because rights are important, because rights are valuable. It is significantly expensive to investigate rape, right? It's, a, it's one of the crimes that's hardest to prove. A lot of times it's he said, she said. It's incredibly expensive to like rehabilitate a domestic violence victim, like from the point of identifying the problem. And I don't think you should just snatch her away from her family and like sue her husband. Like your intervention has to be a lot more complex, right? There's consciousness raising, but you have to do it in a way that's respectful of her autonomy. And after the, like you can't just insist on a criminal justice approach because that might not be in the best interest of the women involved. They might not want their husbands behind bars. So your intervention has to be very carefully thought out. This is an expensive process, right? Can, can I point to very clear benefits to society that I can measure? Maybe I can argue that women will become more productive in the end and contribute to the labor force, but maybe we can just give up on a few women and focus on the productive ones. You know what I mean? Like this is one of those situations where it's only a human rights case that works and not a business case. And that's why some feminists are like, we can't keep focusing on the business case because then it turns rights into instrumentalities. It puts a price tag on rights. We should focus on raising awareness for the idea that women are humans and women's rights are human rights. So that's also another very interesting debate in terms of how advocacy is done.
Do you have other questions? I have one maybe also. Um, so there was one case study you just said, but didn't explain. So I'm just curious about it. So in Slovakia, the country we're in, uh, uh, <laughs> so the fascist party in the parliament uh, raised a law propo proposal to ban abortions, basically. Yeah. And there is like a feminist debate about that. And as as all the feminists I know so far, I didn't hear any feminist arguments to ban abortions. So maybe like, can you point out like not, not only from the feminist perspective, maybe also from the conservative one, like outside of feminist school, but like how does the debate go there? To be honest, I would really have a very hard time um, coming up with a feminist argument in support of banning abortion. Like. I, I think it is very difficult. I think there are um, restrictions on abortion that are a bit easier to justify from a feminist perspective, but like a complete ban as in like, even in the first trimester is a bit hard to justify for me uh, because a, a, you know, a crucial, I guess a crucial cornerstone of feminism is that women have autonomy over their body. So some feminists might say, this is actually what happened in the Philippines, right? Some feminists might say, we agree that abortion is not ideal. We agree that we are making a trade-off here. We might not all agree that the fetus is life, especially in the first trimester, but it does have a potential to be life, right? So this is not a great thing that we are doing. We are trading off the potential for life for a woman's right to her body. Ideally, we don't have, we shouldn't have to be in this situation. So as a feminist, I have a greater commitment to ensuring access to contraception and sex education. As if more and more women are using contraception carefully, and men too actually, and, um, and have access to it, and men are taught to respect women's right to say no, and men are taught to also take responsibility for contraception, then the need for abortion would be significantly less. So some feminists will choose to focus their work on that, right? So they're like, we know this is not an ideal option, so we wanna decrease the likelihood of this option being used. So in the Philippines, when the feminists lobbied for the reproductive health law, it took us, it took us two decades to get it passed. We had to explicitly say in the law that uh, it did not include abortion. Um, and there are two possible explanations for this. One is that it's just a tactical concession, right? We knew that the law would never pass if it had abortion because people because people seem to make a distinction between contraception and abortion. So we were like, we should just let the contraception part pass. So we will give up this battle. The other possibility is some feminists, they make a moral distinction between contraception and abortion. So the explanation I gave earlier, which is abortion is obviously a grayer area. But I think it's very hard to say ban. Another thing feminists might testify is they might say, look, if there are medical professionals who are uncomfortable with performing abortions, we respect their right. What might this mean? This might mean that women might need to travel farther away to access abortions, or they might have to wait a little longer. They might have to spend a little more to get an abortion because their neighborhood doctor doesn't believe in it because for them it's murder. We respect that. Because as feminists, we do, if we respect women's rights to their bodies, we also respect people's religious beliefs to not condemn or commit, commit murder. So I guess like you, you can have a case for restrictions or like some feminists might say, I support abortion in the first trimester or maybe the second trimester. I don't support it in the ninth month, which is kind of like my position. I'm like the moment it is clear that the fetus can live and survive independently outside the woman's womb, I do think the debate changes a little bit. Because I think before the fifth month, when it's not medically viable, I don't think, I, I just don't think it's life. Like I think a woman's life is more important. But when it's like the ninth month, right? Like it's different. Or you're not gonna have feminists justifying infanticide, right? Even if the same arguments apply of like, this is going to change your life, having a child, social stigma, uh, harder to get a job, harder to study, is true, 
but they won't justify it. They only justify it when it is in your womb, right? So I, yeah, I think there is space for some disagreement within feminists, but to defend a complete ban on abortion is very hard to do from a feminist perspective. And maybe like just, just to add on this, so like we once had a debate in Czech debate leaks, which was literally the motion this house would ban all abortions. And so what do you think would be like a legitimate conservative, if there is a legitimate conservative argument? So, you know, it? this was actually a world's final. Um, it was mm -hmm. widely criticized as a motion for the world's final. Uh, this was the final for um, Cork Worlds 2009, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or 10, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, 2009, I think. Yeah, um, in which case I would I, I would just accept the trade-off. I would be like, yeah, this is an imposition on women's bodies, but this fetus is life. So we think society should be focused on, first, ensuring that women have as wide an access to contraception as possible. Two, mm -hmm. ensuring that when women give birth, they have the option to have it given up for adoption. We offer a lot of support for single mothers or or like <laughs> poor women who have kids. So we do everything we can to make the reality of the child, to mitigate it and to make it a bit more convenient for the women because we recognize the trade-off, right? At the same time, when women have sex, there is a, it's not like they are not aware, like there's a there's knowledge and reasonable expectation that it can result in the creation of a life. So this is not something we are imposing on them without their consent. That there is implicit consent to the creation of a life, right? The moment you have unprotected sex. And then um, we just need, there's no advocate on behalf of the unborn child, like it's unable to defend itself or speak for itself. And so as a society, we need to serve as, as its advocate and assume that it would prefer to live. And given that that is the case, like, we need to err on the side of like life in the situation. Also, the standards for medical viability are like fluctuating with the advent of medical technology. We're starting to realize that fetuses in their fourth month could actually be medically viable already, could actually like be life. Uh, and um, given that that is the case, we again want to err on the side of caution and not murder. I guess is what I would argue. So I'd argue there's implicit consent. We will offer a lot of support to mitigate the impact of this thing of having a child, but we need to legislate on behalf of actors that are defenseless and can't protect themselves. So for me, as a feminist, I actually think abortion is a form of self-defense because I think if I had like a thing growing in me that I did not want to be there, in effect, my body is being attacked, right? In effect, this thing is making demands on me that I um, am not willing to give it. So in order to defend myself, like I need to be able to abort it. But the other side can flip this too and go, but the fetus has a right to self-defense too, right? It has a right to defend itself against um, extermination. And we are making a reasonable assumption that it wants to live. And we are making a reasonable assumption that we are its custodians because the, the mother is not in a position to decide for it because it, the mother has a conflict of interest in the situation, right? Um, I guess, yeah, I guess that's how I would argue it. I would argue it on prop. Okay, I do, I do think it's very hard for prop, to be honest, to completely ban. There are some abortion debates like, or conscientious objection for medical professionals allowing them to opt out or the other one um about uh whether women should be made to wait before they they go undergo an abortion or should they be made to see an ultrasound of their fetus i think this is quite cruel and emotional blackmailing but you can defend it i feel right but complete okay. ban i feel is really hard mm -hmm. Any other questions? I it, we're close to eight, and I think you guys are like <laughs> falling asleep. <laughs> no. Um, I have just one very quick question. Sure. Um, to get back to the four schools of thoughts, uh, or how to call it? Yeah, sure. 
yeah they are not mutually exclusive right no. like some are to an extent but for example you can be post-structuralist and let's say a liberal or something like that yeah so in life so in debate land you might have to draw these distinctions because you're trying mm -hmm. to create debates right but in life please do not think of these things as separate perspectives you are correct okay. a lot of times they i should have emphasized this more actually a lot of times they overlap a lot of times like certain issues you will be drawing more from this perspective certain issues you'll be drawing more from so in terms of advocating for abortion rights i am completely with the radical feminists i think we should talk about the universal female experience of motherhood and like the risk of like and you know like the impact of the disproportionate gendered impact of that but I also sympathize with the post-structuralists in terms of gender should be fluid. But I actually sympathize with the liberal feminists about sex work. I think we should be decriminalizing sex work. We should respect the choice of women to engage in sex work. Marxist feminists and radical feminists will completely disagree with me on this. I have a very liberal perception on porn. I think porn can be reformed. I think uh, if our problem is porn right now is very heterosexual and violent, that doesn't mean we should kill porn. It just means we should change what people find sexy. So if the state should have feminist porn, if the state should get involved in like creating like more egalitarian forms of porn, then so be it instead of banning porn. But like Marxist and radical feminists are like porn bad, 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 bad. So I don't think it's helpful to like lock yourself in a box. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. All right, guys, I'm going to let you go. But if you have any questions, you can find me on Facebook anyway. Just send them over anytime between now and the tournament, because like I, I would like you to do well. I wish you very well. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you. It was amazing Thanks. and very helpful. OK, no worries. Um, good luck, then. Yeah, Thank thanks. you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye, guys. See ya. Yeah, see ya. Thank see ya. You. Bye. See you. See you.